So, so yeah. So let me uh, lecture on the remaining uh, vector content that uh, um, uh, good for me to cover as a kind of foundational basis for um, for other times when you will see vectors emphasized in this physics class. So your textbook section, uh, section 2.1, it covers most of the things about vectors, the new type of mathematical quantity that we introduce. Uh, you might have seen vectors in your other math classes. Uh, I have to imagine it's covered in math 3C for those of you who are already uh, to multivariable calculus. Uh, I don't know if it will be covered in earlier math classes. Some aspects of what you'll see me talk about now in the next uh, uh, 10 to 20 minutes, it, it would have covered in trigonometric class. Uh, what's new in our class is the introduction of vectors, uh, the conceptual aspects of which I talk about in this lecture. So, uh, so what we'll uh, cover now is more uh, formalistic approach, uh, more about the notations of vectors, some of the algebra you do with the vectors, and some of the calculations you may need to do with the vectors. So within this uh, um, sec textbook section, they introduce this notation that you will see used for vectors. And uh, th this is a kind of, a, um, and I want you to highlight that as um, to ask you to watch out for uh, this convention. So whenever you see a letter with an arrow on top, that's our notation, meaning that this is a special kind of quantity that's a quantity that has magnitude and direction. And uh, <laughs> the mathematical properties of this is different from the numbers you have been dealing with, scalars. So you want to pay uh, close attention whenever you see a letter that has an arrow on top. Now, when you look at different textbooks, some textbooks will use different notations. There are textbooks that use just the bold face uh, to indicate um, vectors, no arrow. Just bold face <laughs> means vector. Um, this is kind of one of the reasons to read the textbooks from cover to cover, so that they usually explain these things at the beginning part of the textbook. So uh, you know the convention for the textbook that you are reading. Um, some other typeset content won't have the bold face part, just have the arrow. And uh, and I think this uh, expression here it kind of illustrates that well. Uh, this kind of notational compactness. So in this single um, expression, you have a vector, you know, a letter with arrow on top. You have this absolute value sign, which me, which is is a shorthand for the mathematical operation that you are going to do to take the just the magnitude of the vector. Um, it has some relation with the the absolute value that you've been working with with the real numbers, but not. 100%. <laughs> they are related, but not the same. Uh, but this absolute value symbol means you are taking the magnitude of the vector. And once you've taken the magnitude, it's no longer a vector. That's why the quantity on the left-hand side, which is equal to that, is a scalar. It no longer has the arrow on top. So, so you will see that uh, as you see me uh, write vector-related quantities, if I'm writing it down its magnitude, you'll see basically the same letter without the arrow. That means the magnitude. Uh, there's a kind of compactness there, which can be confusing until you get used to it. Once you get used to it, it's super convenient. So, so yeah, that's a, um, that's a, um, vector notations. And I think I want you to talk a little bit about uh, vector algebra. So let me just uh, um, write down some things that you can do with these new mathematical quantities. So let me call this vector. Algebra. And um, in the other lecture, I already covered the kind of the conceptual idea, how to do the visual uh, vector algebra. So um, here I will do as little of that as possible and just uh, stick with um, as, stick with the, the, um, the just the writing down of symbols. I, I will try not to use uh, the drawings and pictures, which is actually hard for me. Um, as a reminder of what we mean by algebra, this is kind of what we mean by algebra. Um, it, so 
you've been dealing with the numbers, so I'm going to let A, B, and C represent um, numbers, real numbers, or they could be complex numbers too. Numbers. Then there are some kind of operations that you could do uh, when we were covering arithmetic. Uh, you could add them, you could subtract them, you could multiply them, and you could divide them. And uh, as we focus more on the more abstract uh, ideas in math, I want to want you to start thinking of these operations in a way where this addition and subtraction they are actually not that different from each other. It's really one operation, addition. And the multiplication and division, they are properly wise, they are actually not that different from each other. So they are just the one operation, multiplication. And uh, there are some algebraic properties of numbers that you've uh, been dealing with. Like if you have um, some number plus another number, you know, a uh, list of properties that's associated with that. They are associative, meaning you can do this or you can do this and the end result is the same. That's the associative property. They commute with each other, meaning this uh, addition is the same as this addition and so on. There are those properties. And many of the properties you had for addition, they also apply to multiplication. Multi scalar multiplication is associative, they commute. Um, the one relationship where you have seen, um, you see both addition and multiplication together is this operation where you have an addition and you have a multiplication. Then um, they have what's called distributed property. This multiplication, it distributes into each term in the addition. So it becomes a times a C plus B times a C. So what makes multiplication different from addition other than the, the, the uh, prior order of operations? <laughs> One would be this um, distributive property. Uh, multiplication are the kind of, what we call multiplication or product, are the kind of operations that will obey this kind of distributive property. And the what we will call addition, um, I guess in this class we don't have other more complicated ideas of addition that you might see in linear algebra. Um, but um, whenever we call, uh, whenever mathematicians call a op uh, binary operation addition, they are thinking ahead to some kind of distributed property. If uh, the operation doesn't have this kind of distributed property, they won't call that operation addition. So, um, so yeah, this is kind of the reminder of the scalar algebra that hopefully you feel comfortable with, <laughs> maybe not in these exact uh, abstract terms, but, um, but it's something that you have seen before. So when we talk about vector algebra, what we are looking at is, okay, so we have these uh, vector quantities. Let's say A, which is going to be a vector, and B, which is going to be another vector, then um, what kind of um, algebra operations can you do with these? And you have seen in the other video that you can do addition. I can do A plus B. And um, in, the, in the other video, <laughs> you've seen me add these visually. And if you're trying to do further algebra with these other than just to writing this down and calling it C, uh, you kind of need more details about that. Uh, so uh, I will demonstrate in a little bit how to add these uh, by component. You kind of need their component to break down to do algebra with them in a familiar way. So we'll hold that off until a little bit. And um, let's see. Just a few minutes ago, I said I want you to think of addition and subtraction as being the same type of operation. And what I mean by that is if you have A minus B, as far as their algebraic properties go, we can treat them in this way. A plus a vector that I'm going to call minus B, 
And I think in order to talk about objects like this, I need the idea of uh, scalar multiplication. So let me introduce one more mathematical object on this page. So I'm going to call it lowercase letter c, no arrow on top. So this is a scalar. And you can multiply a vector by a scalar. In, in some sense, I think it's, uh, the idea is kind of uh, simple and intuitive. You know, imagine you have, um, I don't know, um, B times C, or uh, that dot could get confusing later on. So let me just write it this way. C, scalar, times B. Um, so what this would mean is, so in graphical terms, if you have a um, representation of your vector, like this B, then, um, and C is a number, then what C times B would be is, well, um, it's a vector that points in the same direction as B, and um, its length is C times the magnitude of B. So that's how we would visualize a scalar multiplication. And, uh, and to make a sense of this particular expression, I guess my C has to be minus one, so it's less than zero. So I can kind of have a convention, what it means in these visual terms when your scalar factor is negative. I guess the natural thing to say is, oh, it points in the other direction, 180 degrees the other way around. So this would be if, uh, uh, let me just, in terms of length, just say absolute value. Um, this would be uh, where C is negative. So with the, with the introduction of this idea of scalar multiplication, or um, the term scalar multiplication can be sometimes confusing because uh, we have something called the inner product. Sometimes we call it scalar product. <laughs> so if I want to be super clear what we mean by this, I could say multiplication by a scalar factor. That the two mathematical objects involved in this multiplication is a, a vector and a number, not, uh, not two vectors, <laughs> which uh, we are kind of skipping this, this week. Um, so, so with the introduction of this idea of scalar multiplication, uh, we can uh, re-express any subtractions we see in this form, and we can treat it like addition. So, um, so yeah, I think, and that's the extent of the vector algebra we'll cover for now. Your textbook, chapter two, it does cover additional algebra that you know deals with this multiplicative things. They talk about dot product, A dot B, and they talk about cross product, A cross B. And uh, we'll skip those for now and just uh, um, come back to it later as we use these in physical context. Uh, for the purpose of homework that was due last night, really all you needed to know was the dot product. A dot B is A times B cosine theta. And I covered this in the other <laughs> video that's associated with that particular question. So, so you can look at that. Uh, we'll come back to this. Uh, so the dot product becomes important when we introduce the idea of work and energy. So we will um, do a more proper coverage of that product then. Um, until then, these are the uh, product things that we are skipping for now. So, so yeah, since we are skipping the products, really the only vector algebra we are dealing with is addition. And um, so I said to do this addition, to talk about the addition, we really need to introduce components so that we can add them by components. So let me um, use the remaining five to oh, 10 minutes to talk about those vector components. Uh, by the way, there's a um, FAT simulation that's really useful in visualizing all this and also maybe generating some examples. You can look at it on your own. It's linked from here. It's this vector addition FAT simulation. Um, it's updated version of this simulation. And in, in this simulation, you can kind of um, visualize it for yourself, what I'm going to talk about in a little bit. So you can you know, drag vectors in here, manipulate it, see how the magnitudes relate to the length of the vector, 
see how the angle relates to well, the direction of the vector and the, how the components relate to these. So, um, so these are the things that you can uh, look at. And I guess the it's mostly visually, I hope, uh, self-explanatory. The one convention to get used to is the notion that vectors don't change when you translate them. Because, um, so this is the, what you covered in trigonometry. So in trigonometry, given a point on an xy plane, you've learned to express it in different ways. Those are going to be the components that we are going to talk about. And so, you know, looking at this vector, someone might naively think, okay, the vector ends here. So I have these components, but they don't match up here. And that's because when we talk about vector, we're really thinking of an arrow that starts from somewhere and ends somewhere. And what we care about is that change, uh, not where it ends, just as an absolute quantity, but from where it started to where it ends. That's what we care about. So if we want to kind of have some bridge that connects to what you covered in trigonometry, imagine all the vectors as if their tail is at the origin. Then what the tip is doing in trigonometry terms will match with how we describe vectors. Um, and just to remember that when we have two vectors that are basically translated a version of each other, um, they are the same, like for all intents and purposes, they are the same. We treat them the same, even when they are like all, you know, when they are moved off and translated from each other. So, so I wanted to just point to that so that you have something to um, play with and uh, generate additional examples for yourself. Uh, let me just uh, do the remainder by hand. Um, sorry, I didn't manage the time all that well. So let me just uh, quickly sketch out uh, what I might have. Uh, can the lecture do through more slowly? So this would be a uh, uh, vector coordinate. All this discussion is helped by defining a coordinate axis. So an illustration of 2D plane, an XY plane that you have seen in geometry, trigonometry is very useful. And as a reminder, uh, we kind of divide up this plane into four regions, uh, quadrant one, two, three, and four, and sometimes you might see me refer to those quadrants. If you don't know that, that's fine. You know that's one superior quality of drawing is that if you draw a vector, then you don't have to say second quadrant. You can kind of see where it is. So, uh, so let me say that this is my a vector. Um, then the vector components would be these two smaller two um, two vectors along the x and y direction that will add up to be this vector. So this is my x component of a vector, and this is my y component of the a vector. And, um, and when we talk about converting from, so this vector has a polar, you can give a polar coordinate representation for this vector. It has some length. A, the radius from the origin that the vector ends up at, and it has some angle, theta, that by convention, we always measure from positive x-axis that the, the, the arrow is pointing towards. So that's the parameters of polar representation, and the Cartesian representation of this point in the xy plane would be uh, these components, the x, and the y component. And the kind of the shortcut that connects this uh, polar representation to the Cartesian representation is the right triangle. The uh, right triangle is what you will see represent, emphasized over and over as you see similar types of situations uh, in later content. So it, by right triangle, I mean this triangle. It has got right angle here. And um, th there are some inner angles that you got to figure out. So I have this V, uh, which is, uh, I guess, 180 degree minus theta. And um, so we do this right triangle. You remember so ka toa, uh, which is the kind of mnemonic for 
uh, sine of an angle. Well, let me use phi since I'm using phi for this acute angle. Sine of phi is the opposite. So in this case, ay over the hypotenuse, in this case, a. And chi is the mnemonic for cosine of phi is the adjacent of the angle divided by hypotenuse. And toa is the mnemonic for tangent of phi is opposite ay over ax. If you remember all this from your trigonometry and geometry class, um, that's all you need to convert between the polar representation and the Cartesian representation. And sorry, I'm out of time to do more detailed examples. Uh, I might do that separately in probably future semesters. Um, but um, what's potentially more challenging is the uh, conversion from uh, the Cartesian coordinates to the polar. Because uh, going from the polar to Cartesian, it's uh, helped a little bit by the fact that we have convenient conventions for cosine and sine functions. So, you know, when you, so the for acute angles theta, uh, this Sokatwa, that's the mnemonic, that's how it was originally defined, it all makes sense. Uh, for angles like, so, you know, uh, angles greater than acute angle. So theta uh, here, let's call this 135 degree. For angles like this, uh, cosine and sine of these angles, they are meaningful. Uh, this hopefully was covered in your, I think it was covered in my geometry class. Um, so if you have, I don't know, um, cosine of 35 degrees, then your calculator will give an answer. And this answer with a minus sign is meaningful because this minus sign is indicating that your x component is going in the negative x direction. And uh, I can enter 135 degree uh, sign of that and you get positive of this which uh, corresponds to your y component and um, all these other angles you know greater than 180 degrees also have meaning are, are also are meaningful so if i have 200 degrees which will give me an angle in the third quadrant uh, so sign of that now will be negative because it's going negative the y component is negative so uh, going from the polar to Cartesian representation is almost easier. It's going from the uh, Cartesian to polar representation that takes a little bit more care because when we do that, uh, what we use are these uh, expressions. The Pythagorean theorem, which gives the hypotenuse, the square root of ax squared plus ay squared. That's not too hard. Hopefully, Pythagorean theorem sounds familiar. And uh, what trips up people sometimes is this Toa portion, because we do have this relationship. Tangent of theta is Ay over Ax. So people have this um, 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 uh, temptation to say, oh, so theta is equal to arctangent of Ay over Ax. Uh, let me give you a hypothetical where uh, I have a point here with the uh, x coordinate of minus one and y coordinate of minus one. Let me just do the calculation on a calculator. So I have um, oh, that ratio minus one over one minus one, so that's one. And so I take the arctangent of one and I get 45 degrees. So this point, instead of being at, uh, this is going to be 225 degrees. Um, you think it's at 45 degrees. You have to be careful because um, the inverse trig functions um, are slightly challenging in that you have to restrict to their domain to make them into a fun uh, workable function. So by convention, arctangent is limited where so that their, their, their range is limited so that they will only give an answer within the fourth quadrant as a negative angle or answers in the first quadrant as a positive angle. Uh, because um, the sine of tangent or the sine, <laughs> positive or negative, of tangent is negative, or sorry, positive, both in the third and the first quadrant. You kind of have to work through this and uh, do it carefully. That's, I think, what it comes down to. In the cases where this comes up in like homework problems, you will see me demonstrate, but just watch out for that. 
Uh, all right, so that's uh, I think all the time we have. Um, let me stop that here. And uh, again, I think what I would really recommend people do is practice with this. You know, see if you can convert from the polar representation to Cartesian correctly or Cartesian to polar correctly. This does make it a little bit hard to practice with. Um, well, maybe not so hard if you just to not have this thing. Wait, I don't know. Um, I think if you display the angle, that might be a little bit easier, maybe. But this is a good tool to kind of uh, practice until you feel comfortable with doing those different things.